Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato here with my colleague, Mary Gamba. We kick off this exceptional edition of Lessons in Leadership, talking all about small business and leadership. It's a series we've been doing with the support of our good friends at Delta Dental New Jersey. And, and we kick this particular small business and leadership segment off with Dennis G. Wilson, President and CEO of Delta Dental in New Jersey, and Michelle Burke, partner, Alliance Benefit Solutions. Michelle and Dennis, great to have you with us. Great to be here, Steve. Michelle, good to have you. Yes, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. You got, hey, Dennis, while we put up the website for Delta Dental, tell everyone what the company is and what your footprint is. So Delta Dental of New Jersey in Connecticut uh, is a oral health benefit and wellness company. Uh, we cover nearly 2 million lives across uh, the states of, of, of New Jersey and Connecticut. Businesses of all sizes, lots of small businesses, as we'll reference later, uh, along with, you know, Fortune 1000 companies, school boards, municipalities, et cetera. Uh, uh, our, our, our partner, uh, Michelle, has, has been, a, been a great colleague and, and supporter of ours, and we very much appreciate her business and that of uh, her broker colleagues. Good stuff. Michelle, tell us about Alliance Benefit Solutions. Alliance Benefit Solutions is a brokerage company. We specialize with employee benefits. So what we do every day is we work with the small business owner and we help them not only pick out the benefits for their employees, but also communicate the benefits to their employees. Mm -hmm. Dennis, we've talked about this offline so many times with you and Randy and, and Paul and the team. Um, curious about this. Retention of talented employees, more challenging in small business, I'm not sure, but in any size business, it matters. It matters for us as well. Keys to, a couple of keys to retaining your best people. I think, you know, I, I look at, at, at it as an opportunity, right? Uh, you know, with a, with a small business, and let's define small business for, for a moment. Let's, let's say small business categorically is all employers with under 100 employees, right? Depending on how you look at it, there's different definitions, but that's as probably as good as any. When you go to work for an organization of that size, um, you know, you, you have the potential and possibility, regardless of the position, to be close to the top, if you will, right? You see the boss every day, so to speak. Right. Um, you interact, you know, so there's, I think, a, a connection, um, almost like a family connection, if you will. So, you know, I think that's a, that's a distinct advantage for for small business, but, you know, challenge and, and keeping and getting talent, depending on the, on the industry, of course, right? There's the general cost of labor, which is in, inflated significantly, particularly over the, the last year. There's the, you know, the ability to, to retain uh, these, these individuals, these employees, you know, and you have to really uh, be on your game relative to benefits, relative to compensation, relative to leadership and development programs, all of that. So it's a, it's a challenge, it's new costs and, and, and it's new things that small business has to worry about. Follow up with you, Michelle, on this before Mary jumps in. So <laughs> I, more and more, I, good, answer that question. No, 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 it's okay. Answer that question because I'm also gonna ask about a hybrid workplace, which creates a whole new set of leadership and communication challenges. Michelle, real quick on retention of best people. Yeah, I agree. I think that, um, I think what's important to people sometimes is to be a part of something also. So it's, it's retaining people. It's really important that they're feeling like a part of the company and they know their place in the company. Yeah, but Mary, we've talked about this before. I will not open up that can of worms again. You can do all the right things in your own mind and still that person may move on. And that's part of it. Because Mary, we constantly talk about pivoting, uh, adjusting, and not taking it personally. Check out other programs we did on that at Infinitum. But I want to shift gears. Mary, let's talk a little bit about the combination of in-person and hybrid workplace 
uh, issues around leadership and communication. Mary, jump in on this. Yeah, definitely. Michelle, I would love to get your uh, thoughts on that. If you are working in a hybrid environment and also uh, not even just with your own employees, but also building relationships with organizations like Delta Dental and Dennis and his great team over there, what advice do you have for people communicating and building relationships both internally with their team and externally with key stakeholders in a hybrid environment? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it's absolutely a different challenge. Um, what we like to do is, so people learn and they communicate differently, right? Some people are learners, the way they learn is um, by reading something. Some people have to see it over and over again. So I think it's important that we touch them in different ways. Um, as far as, you know, building relationships, it has to be, you know, you, you need your social, you need your, um, you, you need to encompass all of it together. And it, it, it's tough, but I feel like every company, you know, in order to, um, to, to be able to communicate what they want to, to their employees, it has to be specialized. Like, I just don't feel like it's a one fit for all. And I talk to so many small employers and they all struggle with it. Mary, uh, Dennis, to jump in on Mary's question, we have a great relationship. You, I've seen at the annual Delta Dental golf outing that benefits Special Olympics. You can see the relationships there, and, but that's in person. That's great. That's terrific. How much more challenging is important relationship building, which is a key part of leadership, when there is so much remote communication, Dennis? You have to go the, the, the step beyond, right? You can't take... Um, communications or interactions or relationships for granted. Uh, in other words, you have to reach out, you have to connect more than you would do so. And, and you know, I'll, I'll even preface that by saying, you know, people don't leave companies, they leave other people, right? They, they leave their boss, they leave their coworkers. And when that relationship is simply virtual, it's very easy to press the leave button like you would on, on Zoom, right? So, you know, I think you have to go the extra mile, not only to make sure you preserve those relationships through technology, which we're all thankful to have, but as well as to reach out, you know, have in-person gatherings wherever possible and wherever safe and have special programs as it relates to the development, particularly in leadership skills that kind of pull people together. And let's not forget the fun stuff too, right? Yeah. The, the virtual half hours as we as we do, the, the informal gatherings, the, uh, the, the things that, you know, make people continue to relate to each other, not only within their department, but within the company. And Mary, to that point, as we speak right now, we're doing this program in, in mid-September, we have a a luncheon slash, I'm not sure whether it's a dinner or a luncheon. It's with everyone. It's one of the, it's the first time in two and a half plus years that everyone's been together. And some of these people don't even know each other face mm -hmm. to face, right, Mary? Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important, Dennis. And, you know, uh, to your credit, you hit it right on the head. You need to make sure you go out of your way. It's not easy. It wasn't even easy for me to try to find a date that most everybody, and even with that, there's still one person, Sylvester, I'm so sorry when you're watching this. I know you're going to be out of the country. Sorry, but, Sylvester. You know, sorry, Sylvester. You know, but there's like 20 of us that are going to be getting together. And it's even hard just to find that date and that time to make that happen. But that is so important. And that leads me to my next question, though, um, for you, Michelle, when it comes to small business and the future of small business, how really has the pandemic changed that and the approach to leading a small business, uh, given all the challenges over the past almost three years? I, I mean, again, I feel like it's different. It depends on the industry. But I for us, I um, it was important that we were together, whether it's you know a, a hybrid type of togetherness. We are in the office, um, very flexible with my team, but you know the way we communicate with each other, we need to be together. So that's us. Not everybody's going to be like that. But I think that a lot of companies, I think they're afraid. You know, they're they're nervous. Um, they don't want to, you know, make somebody do something they don't want to do. Um, so it, it's been really challenging. But I think it is. Yeah, I, I think that it's. Um, I think a hybrid type style. Um, is really what we're seeing with most of our clients. And they want to see me. They want me in there. Um, so it, it's kind of surprising, but, but true. Last question on my end, Dennis. Delta Dental has been supporting and helping us make this 
small business and leadership series happen. It's going on a second year. Why, Dennis? Why is it so important that Delta Dental has such powerful, important relationships with small businesses? Steve, I, I, I answer that question with, uh, with some data. And, and I think it, it, tell, it says everything, right? So there's about 4.2 million people employed in the state of New Jersey, all sectors, right? Government, small business, everything, everything in between. So of those, about half work with companies that employ under 100 people. A half. That, that's, half. that's two point. Wait a minute. Hold on. Do my math, Mary. Oh, don't ask me to do math. It's <laughs> about two million. Yes. We'll two say two million, million people. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's to me, that tells the whole story, right? Of uh, one in eight people work for a company right. that employs under 10 people. So that's just incredible uh, when you sort of put that in context as to why small business is so important to not only to the discussion here, but to the economy, to the fabric of communities, to, to, to business in general. Important stuff. And I want to make sure in post-production that we have the website up for Delta Dental New Jersey and Connecticut and also Alliance Benefit Solutions. To Dennis, our longtime partner and, and the friends uh, at Delta Dental cannot thank you enough. To Michelle, Thank you for joining us on, here on Lessons in Leadership, talking all about, and listen, the series on small business, there's so many aspects to it. We'll continue talking about it. Dennis, Michelle, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. You got it. Mary and I will be back right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Most people don't think about where their water comes from, but we do. Veolia more than water, resourcing the world. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamba. Once again, we welcome on Lessons in Leadership our longtime friend and colleague, Rick Thigpen, Senior Vice President, Corporate Citizenship P at PSEG. Good to see you, Rick. Thanks, Steve. Nice to see you again. You got, hey, Rick, listen, we're going to, we've been doing this anecdotally, but we're going to give a name to it. And the name is simply this, Great Leaders of Color. We're going to talk about great leaders of color. We don't well, do that. There's nothing to talk about, Steve. That's great. Yeah, because there's not enough diversity in our discussion about leadership and great leaders. So I'm going to give you some names. We'll show some pictures. People who know who these people are. But I'm going to start with... And Steve, before you go, I just want to add one thing. The more young people who recognize that great leaders come from all different types of colors and religions and backgrounds, the better our country is going to be in the future. So thank you for the work you're doing. Well, and, and Rick, we should let everyone know that this whole focus on featuring people of color, some of whom have passed, and that is part of our public television series, Remember Them, that, and also this series, a lot of this has come from discussions offline with Rick Thigpen about history and about not forgetting and remembering and honoring people who are no longer with us. But on this segment, well, people, some of whom are still with us, some of who have passed. Start with this. What makes former President Barack Obama a great leader? Wow, there's so many things. Uh, he certainly handled his responsibilities in office with style and grace, and he respected his country and his constitution. But in my father's words, he's also great because I never would have believed, Rick, that this country would have elected Barack Obama president. 
It also helped us exercise some of our demons of the past and show that we can embrace people no matter who they are, if they can demonstrate excellence. And he was a role model that will live on forever for many Americans as a positive sign of the greatness of this country. In addition to that, he did things like extend health care to millions of Americans. And really, he tried to bring a sense of dignity and civility to our political discourse, because we're all going to disagree about issues, but we're all going to have to learn to work together. And he was one of those pieces that helped bring us together, in my judgment. So well said. And, and when Rick talks about his dad, I grew up always calling him Chairman Big Pen. Let everybody know who we're talking about. And Steve, I'll add one more thing. Barack Obama is in what I call the Presidential Political Hall of Fame, and that he won two terms with over 50 percent of the vote. And that accomplishment has not been done by many presidents, but that's a special level of presidents in terms of political accomplishment. Real quick, Rick, I appreciate that, but tell them who your dad was and why he mattered so much. Well, he's my dad, so he mattered enormously to me. My dad was, as you mentioned, the former chairman of the Essex County Democratic Party. He was also a Seton Hall prep track star, most importantly for some, and a member of the Seton Hall Athletic Hall of Fame. But he worked very hard to move Essex County forward and to help bring people together and help bridge some of those gaps between urban and suburban, you know, uh, uh, communities in Essex County. And he was a very close friend of Donald Payne's. They worked together for years. Congressman Payne. And he was a part of making Congressman Payne the first African-American elected to the House of Representatives from our state. So I couldn't be proud of my dad. And I hope I can live up to his reputation. I'm doing my best. And as Rick talks about his dad, uh, Phil Thigpen, um, and also on our other series, I talked about Remember Them, we have Congressman Donald Payne talking about his father, the late Congressman Donald Payne, and it's powerful stuff. I'm going to give you another name. Great New Jersey. Michelle, Michelle Obama. Yes. Great leader because? Well, obviously the first first lady of color as well. Another story of dignity and concern about her fellow Americans. She carried a very complicated package in being the first African-American first lady with grace and dignity. She tried to help young people and try to create opportunity. And she was a role model for, including for my daughter, for millions of women in this country on how to handle themselves in the public spotlight. And I think she's a very important example of, of real talent. I'll say, I, I, I'm sorry, I'll use the words again, of grace and dignity in that office. And yeah. I'm, I'm eternally appreciative that she was there as well. Got it. Mary, you got a name. Oh, I do. I do. Um, I would love to go to Muhammad Ali because I know, uh, Steve, you have you were so well read on Muhammad Ali. Uh, talk a little bit about the leadership of Muhammad Ali. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. <laughs> Muhammad Ali was not only an outstanding athlete, he converted to Islam he paid the price for his beliefs in that he was banned from boxing because he refused to go into the Vietnam War. Four his, years. His activism in the world of politics and the world of trying to create a world of greater equality and paying a price for his beliefs is something to be admired by all. He didn't just take his fame and his paycheck and go and only worry about himself and live a great lifestyle. But he's a leader that we all still remember today as the greatest his command of the human language and poetry was absolutely outstanding. His commitment to people was outstanding. And he was an outstanding boxer. So he, he was a unique package that I wish we could all live up to. But he stood for principles and he paid the price for it. He should be admired for it. Yeah, sacrifice gave for what he believed in, whether people agreed or not. Mary, in post-production, we're going to put a picture up in a, from Essex County. I remember, I believe, uh, at, uh, I'm not sure where it was in New Jersey, I'm drawing a blank. We used to have all these banquets and, and party events, and somehow Muhammad Ali was there, and there's a picture of Muhammad Ali, would, and the end of his fist is my jaw. And I, was so, I, I had to look at that picture. Mary, you never saw that picture. I don't picture. think I've ever seen that photo, Steve. And, and Rick, he, remember he always used to he always pull out cards, he have, or he'd always do a magic trick. He'd always do a magic trick. Anyway, I'm, let, let's move on. I got another name for you. This is back closer to home, someone who's still with us, uh, the lieutenant governor in the great state of New Jersey, Sheila Oliver. Great leader because. A great leader because for so many reasons, the first African-American woman to be elected speaker of our General Assembly. I have the privilege of knowing Sheila for a long time and watching her rise in the world of politics. 
Her commitment to public service has been for her entire adult life. I'm so proud that she also has a graduate degree from Columbia University's Teacher College. She is now the first African-American woman to be Lieutenant Governor of the state of New Jersey, holding a statewide office. She has been a leader of great impact. I share her hometown now of East Orange, New Jersey. I think Sheila might correct me and say her hometown originally was Newark, New Jersey. That's but right. She's an East Orange resident, of, so I'll call East Orange out. Um, her political achievements, both at the county level, being an Essex County freeholder at, in the state assembly and now as Lieutenant Governor are noteworthy. She's another one who's carried herself with amazing grace. She has a, a record of success and she's helped make our state better and helped make our state more open to the simple idea of fairness by her leadership and by showing people that leaders can come from different places and look differently and still represent the state well. How about I'm this so one? Proud of her. Mary, the, one of the other names you and I were talking about because he's been on the air with us before on the public television side. He's retiring from the state Senate. He has served for many, many years in the city of Newark and some of the surrounding towns. State Senator Ron Rice, a great leader because? I'm so proud to have known Ron Rice for so long. Like Sheila Albert, I feel special, Steve, because these people, these great New Jerseyans have touched my life as well. I was there as an aide to Councilman Donald Payne when Ron Rice first got elected West Ward Councilman in 1982, and we've stayed friends since. I've watched his rise in politics. I watched Ron Rice do the hard work at the local level to become not only a state senator, but a state senator who could speak his mind and speak truth to power as he saw fit. It took courage. It took a lot of work. Ron Rice surprised a lot of leaders with his ability to get votes in places they didn't expect and his ability to survive, even when the party leadership thought he should not survive. He was, he's a voice that the African-American community came to really admire. He was an independent voice. He was committed to his community. He was a West Warder from the very beginning to the very end of his life. He was one of the longest serving, longest tenured uh, members of the state Senate. He ruffled a lot of feathers, but he also did a lot of good for people. And he never lost touch with the grassroots and used his power to do what he thought was right. And again, another voice to help make our state greater by bringing a greater sense of equity to New Jersey. P.S. Before we move to the last name, Mary, uh, think about this. One of the greatest leaders in the world of media, a leader of color, a great leader of color. We'll go to her in just a second. But I want to remind folks that on our sister series on the other side, Remember Them, Rick will be joining us to talk about um, two very significant New Jersey leaders who are no longer with us. One is State Senator Winona Lippman, the first African-American to serve in the state Senate, and also uh, former Speaker of the House, Lower House, Howard Woodson, Reverend Howard Woodson, Mary, who's that name I'm talking about? She, listen. Uh, could it, could it, now maybe Oprah? by one name. I don't go by one name. She goes by one. She's the only, go ahead. Oprah. Who, Oprah. Makes, yeah. So what makes Oprah a great leader? People go, yeah, she made a lot of money. She's made a lot of money. Great in the media. Brilliant branding. But a leader, right? Oprah started as a talk show host and climbed the ladder. She connected with millions and millions of Americans and was a special role model for women and a special, a double a special role model for African-American women. And then her level of success is just beyond sight. Very few people could even imagine being as successful as Oprah. She's used her success to try to advance causes she considers just. She was an early supporter of state of state senator and then United States Senator Barack Obama, who, be, who wanted to become president of the United States. And she's one of those people who has helped make our country greater by her success, by her commitment to social justice, by her involvement in public affairs issues, and simply by her role model, because her path to success didn't come easy. And I'll say again, she was an inspiration to millions and millions of women across this country that you can do it too. And it's just so impressive what Oprah's accomplished. Rick, when we talk about great leaders of color, one of the things we, I think we miss is that even though I'm a student of leadership and Mary and I have been doing this program for several years talking about leadership or what, who great leaders are or what makes great leadership, I don't think we understand or appreciate how much more difficult it is for leaders of color to be the greatest in their field, be it Muhammad Ali or Barack Obama uh, or uh, Oprah or Sheila Oliver 
we're often talking the first. And being the first makes it that much more challenging, particularly in a world dominated by folks who don't look like you, who are in the, quote, so-called dominant culture. Yes. Talk about that. Well, Jackie Robinson comes to mind as the first, a classic example of that. But Steve, I'll start, I'll say again, the most important lesson in my own judgment is that great leaders frequently overcome adversity, but they come from all different backgrounds. There is no monopoly on greatness, that there's greatness in all different types of people. And that's the, the most important lesson because the people really understood that that would help bring us together and not think that you've got to save your country from other people because if they get it, things will go down. And in fact, we are all uh, we are all human. As to your specific point, there is no doubt at all that being the first can be harder and that overcoming doubts, suspicion that you're not qualified, you're not capable, you really aren't the type of person that can do it, it does make it harder. And then the, as, as I heard Jackie Robinson talk about a little bit, and I can remember my mother talking about Jackie Robinson when really? we were all rooting for Jackie Robinson to get a hit. Well, that's extra pressure when you're representing your race or representing all these people. You're not just out there to hit the baseball or, or punch somebody in the nose like Muhammad Ali or shoot a basketball like Bill Russell. You're out there representing your race. And that, you know, that makes things that much more difficult to you because you feel the pressure. So overcoming doubts, overcoming adversity is a human condition and it's universal. And there's no doubt that we as African-Americans have a lot of experience with that ex uh, situation. And it does make things uh, more challenging at times. It's interesting, Mary, that uh, Rick talks about Jackie Robinson because on, on Remember Them, our public television series that I do with Jackie Tricarico, our great executive producer and co-host of that series, we feature, it's interesting, you're talking about Jackie Robinson, but I, ironically, Rick, we're talking about leadership. We feature Larry Doby from Patterson, Patterson, New Jersey. New Jersey. You got see he he very he walks around knowing this stuff. You you could just that's what I said. You can literally call out any name, and Rick's like, I got that. I got a you my know, father introduced me to Larry Doby. I got a chance to meet him. Another great person. By the way, and Larry Doby, Larry Doby, first African American play in American League. Where did you meet him? Well, we're going to show a picture. I, I believe it's Seton Hall. Hall. Yeah. I, who knows? I was a young man. My father introduced me to him. I believe it was at Seton Hall at some event. But Larry Doby also led the American League in home runs twice and in RBIs one time. And it's another example of this being first. Jackie Robinson bore the burden, but he was a Hall of Fame second baseman. And, you know, not long after Jackie Robinson came names like Willie Mays and Hank Aaron. And it's just a, a little example of how we really need to change our attitude about people. I mean, can you imagine baseball without Hank Aaron? It's just unthinkable. And who thinks anybody was better than Willie Mays at playing center field? You know, greatness comes from so many different types of people, but they have to be given an opportunity. And that's the lesson here. And Larry Doby, again, from Patterson, really an outstanding American League player. Everybody forgets the second guy, but he, he also suffered some of those slings and arrows. And he, he knew how to hit a baseball. And I said he led the American League in home runs twice, I believe, in RBIs once. So he was no slouching guy by any stretch at all. But he's from right here. That is, uh, you've been listening to a walking historian who just knows stuff that, I don't know where he gets this, but he also reads a lot. And that's, and he cares deeply about history. And I want to thank our good friend, Rick Thigpen, who puts perspective on great leaders of color. And you can check him out on our, as I said, Remember Them series, talking about a whole range of other leaders from New Jersey, no longer with us, but that we must remember. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much for having me on, Stephen. Thank you very much, Mary, for having me. Thank you. Lessons in Leadership. See you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, Veolia, resourcing the world, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.
most people don't think about where their water comes from. But we do. Veolia. More than water. Resourcing the world.